much. Well, the world does look like a pretty dangerous place at the moment, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> the, um, in January this year, the doomsday clock was moved 30 seconds nearer to midnight. It's now set at two minutes to midnight. This is nearer than it's been any time since 1953, which is when the US and Russia first tested hydrogen bombs, both in the same, in the same year. Now, if people don't know what that is, it's a, a clock set up by the Bulletin of At Atomic Scientists, and it's, it indicates the closer to midnight it is, the more likely global, global annihilation by nuclear war, or now they include uh, the elements of climate change, are. So that's, that's what they think. In terms of the idea of are we heading for a new Cold War, it's a phrase that you hear a lot, isn't it? I mean, only in April, Antonio Guterres, who's the UN Secretary General, declared, the Cold War is back, with a vengeance, but with a difference. The mechanisms and safeguards to manage the risks of ex escalation that existed in the past no longer seem to be present. We've also seen, and this is, you know, more recently, Mike Pompeo, who is Trump's latest Secretary of State, is sometimes quite hard. You really have to look at Twitter before you do a meeting to check who's gone, who's resigned, been sacked by Twitter, you know. But I, as far as I know, at the moment, he still is. Um, he's an old Tea Party right-winger. That's one thing about Trump. The people around him now are much more Trump people than they were even when his, his regime <laughs> began. But he's gone out by saying, we are going to crush Iran. And, and we know that U.S. envoys are going all around Europe saying nobody should buy Iranian oil. And then Iran has responded by saying, we are going to close the uh, Hormuz uh, um, for Straits, yes, the, where all the Gulf oil comes. And that would be, you know, a massive um, escalation in the region. But this is something that Trump and his envoys are whipping up um, and something that really does look like um, it could turn into something more serious. Um, then Trump himself, well, we know, you know, he, he loves Twitter, and he uh, said about North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, he said, Will somebody from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I too have a nuclear button, but it's a much bigger and more powerful one than him, and my button works. Um, so, I want to avoid this being a cook's tour, by the way, of every conflict, because to be honest, we would be here all day. I want to try and give an overview of what the strains and stresses and tensions are in the world, and what's different now than, than today. But so there you go. That's him on Twitter. But not just off the cuff is he threatening um, and ha using these aggress aggression and, and these sort of words. In a very scripted speech to the UN General Se Assembly, Trump said the United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Now, those words in a scripted speech to the UN tell you something. Now, I'll come back to that because of clearly they've now met and they have married each other as these great authoritarian leaders. But um, I'm just giving you a picture of what the um, escalation, if you like, um, of threats has, has happened. And it isn't just words. I mean, Trump has authorized the first new nuclear warhead in 34 years. When it comes to nuclear weapons, still in the world, despite other countries, Israel and others having them, um, Russia and, and the US still possess about 90% of the world's nuclear weapons and who can destroy the world, you know, a zillion times over. Let's say, you know, one weapon can do a lot more than what a weapon could do at the time of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, on the other side of what was the old Cold War um, enemies, if you like, uh, Putin in Russia, he declared in March that Russia has built a new cruise missile that could reach anywhere in the world. Um, so you can see the, the sense of wanting to play off each other to say, you don't want to mess with me. And it was only back in, during the UK, Ukraine crisis in 2014 where Putin said, I want to remind you that Russia is one of the most powerful nuclear nations. This is a reality, not just words. Now, I am not arguing that nuclear war is imminent or two minutes away. I want that to be that to be clear. Um, not that I can, not that I know, but you know. But I think in terms of what's going on, there is still a sense that actually nuclear war is so destructive for the regime that starts it or tries to defend itself against it. So there's still, you know, there, there's issues with that. But I think that when we look at uh, Trump's politics and his ra and his you know, presidency, of course, we always have to talk about the possibility of accident of, as Alex said in a meeting the other day, of stumbling into another war and or of smaller conflicts escalating into something, something bigger. And I think the volatility and st instability that he has created globally is something that I think we have to take into account when we look at the prospects now. Because actually, when 
uh, when lots of people thought Clinton was going to win, she was a known quantity. She was a hawk. She was somebody who had supported the Iraq war. Um, whereas actually Trump is an unknown quantity. He is somebody that cannot be um, predicted. And I mean, I don't know if anybody's watched a fascinating documentary about the New York Times reporting on the first year of Trump. I mean, they didn't have a clue about him, did they? They still don't actually. I mean, it shows, you know, these people are paid full time to work on this, you know, internationally known newspaper. Still don't have a bloody clue um, about populism, how it works and everything else. And I think that that sense of when we look at Trump, we have to look at what are the things driving that politics. Borders, a strong national state, the whole attacks on immigrants, and that America first doctrine, when it's translated into foreign policy, has become very much like we're going to stand on our own, dump international alliances, and, uh, and go it alone. And I think that, you know, this idea that he portrays the rest of the world as living off the US, poor US, here they are, you're ripping us off. Here they are, relying on our big nuclear weapons and all the rest of it. And actually, you know, there's a NATO meeting later this month, and he calls NATO obsolete, you know, and says, really, they all have to spend more money in defense because we're not going to defend them anymore. Um, and at the EU, the same, he says they're not pulling the weight. What Trump says about the EU, we love the countries of the European Union. But the European Union, of course, was set up to take advantage of the United States to attack our, to attack our piggy bank, right? We can't let that happen. Now... If you, if you look at it like that, you can see the sense of what Obama tried to do, the sort of more multilateral approach uh, because of what had happened in Iraq, and I'll come back to that, but actually Trump is ripping that up at the moment. Um, and I'm not saying this will be how it always is, and I always have to have that sort of caveat with anything you say about what Trump is doing, but at the moment that's what it is. And I think, you know, you've got a situation where... Um, as I said, that he is um, he attacked North Korea in the, saying he was going to destroy it, and then he went and had a talk, and he says he's got this new detente and called <laughs> off the war games in the region. But actually, who knows what will come of that, you know, and whether there'll be some other, you know, new, you know, I've got a bigger button than you exchange and something more dangerous. But at the same time, um, he has, you know, ripped up the deal with Iran that Obama and others put together, and this is what has escalated the idea that sanctions are back and that actually Trump doesn't want anybody to buy US oil. And he's going around saying, the Saudis have promised me that they're going to deliver us more oil at a lower price and I'll all be fine. Uh, you know, um, let's see. But that sense of, you know, how um, the ripping up of the deal, wanting to really destroy anything that he sees as Obama's legacy, um, and actually saying, we could go it alone and we don't need these things. It was a bad deal, I had to get rid of it. But that sense of how that can then also turn into something else. For a president who stood on a non-interventionist ticket, he's been pretty active. Um, there were some in the Stop the War uh, movement who said, well, it, you know, Clinton was a war hawk, at least he isn't. But, you know, I think we've got to get used to the idea that this is a very, very intervention and interventionist president and really has implications for all of us. But there's also a contradiction. With all this aggressive posturing, there's also... Um, should I use it? Yes. Sir. Okay, thank you. Use it. Okay. With all the aggressive posturing, there's also a contradiction in this sort of band of warring brothers with Trump against the world. Because also when you look at the connections that Trump has shown to be have with the Russian state. You know, this is, you know, who was traditionally the Cold War um, enemy. And I think, you know, you've got to, and I want to look at some of the features in common, that the, the politics behind them um, that, that there are. And I think that, uh, you know, he can't hide his sort of admiration, if you like, in many ways for the strong man that Putin portrays himself as. In the same way with Kim Jong-un, the this, this sense of, oh, well, actually, I want to be this strong leader that everybody's scared of and doesn't want to challenge. But... When you look at it like this with the, the people that I've mentioned, the leaders that are, that are making these deals or ripping up these deals and all the rest of it, it can seem really that we are, our, ha you know, we're, our lives and futures of ours and many around the world are in the hands of unpredictable, dangerous individuals who care more about vanity and everything else than they do about world peace. And I think to a certain extent, you know, there is a truth in that because I think we can talk and we will discuss the whole sense of the logic of capitalism, um, the geopolitical conflicts that flow from intense economic competition, which is at the root and implicit to capitalism. But we also have to be concrete, concrete about those specific people who represent and who are leading the states who, and look at what they feel they need to do 
to maintain their power or they feel they need to be seen to do to maintain their power. So there is a link between the political, ind between the individuals and the politics that they represent and the nature of the structures of the system which inevitably drive to competition and drive to interpolist conflicts. So I think it's important that this is not just an abstract question. It is very concrete. So I think that it's, um, there's so much talk of, um, you know, the, the new Cold War and everything. And, and one reason why did it happen so much, I think it's important just to look quickly, briefly at Britain, even though we are a minor player, however much it might upset, you know, the wee smogs and everything else of the world. Uh, you know, we are a minor player that catching on to the coattails of American stuff. But the old adversary, Russia, has been very resurrect in a very big way, hasn't it, around the poisoning in Salisbury and this sense of what they've done. I mean, there's still no actual proof, you know, of what happened, let alone what happened to the, the more recent couple. Um, but May, Theresa May really milked it, didn't she? Because actually, when you're in a corner as a, as a prime minister, there's nothing better than finding an enemy out there that you can try and get everybody to point to. And, uh, and actually, it was hilarious, because I think they kept on calling him a Russian spy. Well, obviously, he was Russian, but he was spying for the West. Um, but, you know, but again, that sense of trying to sort of disassociate themselves with the sort of um, the shenanigans of what goes on and with... Um, inter-imperial sort of spying and the, the things that go on under the surface. But I think, you know, when you look at it, the, the sense of actually using both that, the poisoning to attract attention away from her and say, look at this dreadful Russia, but also it was a chance for her to try to find some unity with the EU leaders with whom she is warring um, and saying we have to all unite against Russia and impose more sanctions and everything else. So these things can be played by the ruling class in ways that might benefit themselves. More recently, we've seen attacks on Russia for supposedly getting involved in the Leave campaign over the EU referendum. And, uh, you know, this sense of actually, you know, anything that they can dig up, if you like, to say, oh, it's Russia, it's Russia. Now, sometimes it will be Russia, but let's look at how it plays. Why does it benefit Theresa May and others to, uh, to have the, the, bogey, the bogeyman, we'd have called it when we were kids, you know, of the sense of creating this as the enemy. But I think, you know, Russia's not just, a, you know, a suck it out of your thumb, pretend enemy. You know, the fact of the role that Russia's playing in global politics today is something that terrifies the West because the sight of it increasing its reach and regional power base uh, through its alliances with Iran and in, uh, in the Syria conflict, we've just been, some of you may have been at the meeting, the fantastic meeting that was just being had about Syria and what's happened um, with Syria's dictator Bashar al-Assad. I mean, Russia have helped Bashar al-Assad crush the revolution. That's, you know, that's what Russia's done there. I mean, somebody got up on the meeting and said, oh, but Russia came in to stop the jihadis taking over and actually Bashar al-Assad as a secularist and, you know, so maybe it was a good thing. No, Russia went in there because they needed to protect their power base and uh, they have a very important um, naval base there at Tartus, which, which is the only one in the Mediterranean that Russia can use that docks nuclear submarines. And in fact, at the beginning of uh, 2011, when the revolution first broke out in Syria... A Putin sent an uh, aircraft carrier and task force to the base to show his support for al-Assad's regime. So this isn't, you know, a, no imperial power, whether they're a global power or a small bit player. Um, they're doing it to try in some way to either extend or maintain their reach and their dominance and their control and influence. And I think that, you know, what Syria has become, and that's the tragedy of Syria, not only has a revolution um, you know, being beaten, but actually it has become a bloody war game for the ruling classes of other imperial powers. It's not a game for the people who suffer the most, the Syrian people, those that are there, as well as the millions that have been, um, you know, had to flee and are refugees both in the region as well as trying to get into, get into Europe. And I think that sense, I mean, Alex Klinikos and the late Zayas Jay called it a multi-level chess game. And I think that's absolutely uh, what, it's, um, what it's been like. And I think that's the, the idea that, I mean, you know, everybody's in Syria really, aren't they? I mean, Britain is, the US, Turkey, Iran. You know, that sense of actually people trying to um, battle over uh, what has become this strategic um, area, that sense of it doesn't matter what happens to the millions of ordinary people. You know, it doesn't matter what's happened. You know, the, the country is being destroyed. And, uh, and this is something that, you know, even when U.S. says they're going in to fight ISIS, and that's when, you know, the whole 
discussion in the British Parliament. It's like the international brigades. You know, in the, the Spanish Civil War, we heard from Hillary Benn, you know, when he was trying to encourage the fact that, that Britain should go in and help bomb against ISIS. You know, uh, this is a nonsense, and I don't need to say that in a meeting here, but that sense of... Um, what, you know, the arguments that were used to go into Syria um, were supposedly, you know, um, to stand up for against the most dangerous element. Um, but obviously, you know, the most dangerous element is Assad himself, who has killed the most people. And I think that sense of the multi-level chess game that Alex describes, you know, that actually the US and Britain has sometimes been bombing ISIS, which actually is in the same as what Russia and Assad are doing, but sometimes been bombing or and support, sometimes been supporting groups that are fighting Assad in order, at one time, they hope they could have regime change. So, you know, this is something that alliances are not principled. Alliances are not about helping, you know, any progressive moves in the country. Alliances are always about what suits the ruling classes in those countries at the time. Now, of course, um, Syria isn't Russia's only um, uh, sort of way that we've witnessed them trying to assert themselves more strongly. I mean, we've seen in the past the battle for Georgia. We've seen the standoff over Ukraine I mentioned in 2014, which actually saw, you know, NATO. Um, remember, it's a North Atlantic treaty organization. You know, they're really pretty far from the North Atlantic, aren't they, um, when they're coming right up again. But of course, what they're trying to do is encircle um, the, the countries that might, you know, that are associated with Russia, the whole idea of Russia being encircled by uh, Western Western controlled uh, region and, you know, Russia's then grabbing of Crimea. Um, that, that, that whole um, sense of the, the borders, if you like, of the West creeping eastwards um, is something that we've also got to keep in our mind because, you know, there were some arguments on the left of poor little Russia. You know, the West is attacking it. We, you know, in some way got to stand up for them. I really utterly reject that. But we also have to understand what the West was trying to do, you know, and it is trying to increase its reach eastwards. And I think this takes me really... Just as a, as a little aside, I just wanted to look at what the real Cold War, you know, the original Cold War looked like, because I think it helps us understand what's going on today, and then I'll look at what, what, what the differences are today, and finally at the sort of the nationalism and the, the right-wing populism that's driving some of the politics around some of this. Because, you see, I think, you know, there'd be many in the room that don't remember the Cold War at all. You know, it was finished what, about three decades ago, and, you know, really you were looking at a completely bipolar world you know, Western, I mean, the U.S. effectively, but the West uh, versus Russia. And physical expression, if you like, in the, in the Berlin Wall, but, but that sense of a bipolar wor world dominated everything. And, you know, clearly this was um, both economic competition, military, political. Um, the right-wing ideologues in the West said it's all about evil communism versus wonderful liberal democracy. There was even many in communist parties of the West who also portrayed it in these ideological terms of, you know, plucky Russia, socialism, a communist state, fighting against the evils of Western imperialism. Um, and I think, you know, in this narrative, you've got a situation where countries that were dominated by Russia or that faced uh, struggles, you know, national liberation struggles to try and get rid of Russian control were seen and denounced by some of the communist parties as being counter-revolutionary. You got a situation where Russia was portrayed in countries, Cuba and others, as being the upholders of national liberation against America. And, and this is really leads, that sort of campus politics leads to the situation where I described today somebody in the meeting upstairs saying, you know, we've got to, you know, fight the Bashar al-Assad is in some way progressive and, you know, fights against them are more reactionary. And I think that it's very important for us to say in our tradition, in the IS tradition, you know, we did not have either of those positions. We stood on it and actually below the socialist worker masthead for many a long year was neither Washington or Moscow. Now, sometimes we did get told, go back to Moscow. I remember that in the 80s. But that, but that sense of actually saying there, we have no illusions of the Soviet Union being a force for progressive politics, let alone socialism or communism at all. And so that, therefore, we understood that if there was wars going on where Russia was trying to crush a liberation movement or crush a movement from below, we were with the people from below trying to get... We didn't see them as counter-revolution. We saw them as something that we should support. And we saw that Russia trying to... The proxy wars that sometimes Russia got involved in were, were exactly that, were a way of it trying to extend or maintain its control. So I think it's important for us to say that. But, but certainly, when it comes to the idea of how the Cold War structured people's sort of sense of the impending doom, if you like, you know, the sort of how many minutes to, to midnight. I mean, 
we are nowhere like where if people described, and I don't remember this, but the Cuban, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62, you know, the sense that people felt that we were on the brink, you know, of, of a possible nuclear conflict between America and the Soviet Union. And in Britain, and this bit I do remember, in the early 1980s, and some of you remember, the government launched a public information campaign, Protect and Survive. I mean, I looked a bit of it online, you know, one of the pamphlets just for this meeting, and I mean, you know, it is laughable if it wasn't meant to be serious, you know. Tip, if you don't have a, you know, a, a cellar or a coal bunker, you know, tip a table against the wall, uh, get underneath it, fill your bath with water, cover it up so it doesn't get covered in, you know, nuclear fallout, you know. And actually, but this was a real, you know, this, it was being argued that this was something that we had to address because it was so, it was uh, so serious and, and uh, such a possibility. In America, an opinion poll done in 1983 found that about a half of the American people thought that they'd die in a nuclear war. So that was what the real Cold War both was and felt like. Now, a nuclear war then did not, um, did not break out, and the only, per the only country, the only state to have used nuclear weapons in a conflict is still the U.S., and we've seen the devastation caused by um, those weapons, you know, made in the 40s. You can just only imagine what weapons made today could do. But I think, you know, I don't have time to go through the whole story, if you like, of, the, of why America won the Cold War effectively, you know, in terms of the economic competition, in terms of Russia not being able to maintain, uh, why it cost it more and was basically bankrupt by that arms race and by the, the, um, what it had to do it to its own populations who, you know, at various stages rose up against the, uh, the Soviet Union. I don't have time to go through that. But what I do need to say is that Russia's defeat and America's victory in the Cold War, if you like, it, it gave a situation where you were in a, a new situation. I mean, it led to, people remember famously Francis Fukuyama saying in 1989 that it was the end of history because the U.S. was really in global, globally in charge. There was going to be, you know, this was, a, this was a new era. Now, it was a new era, um, but not in the way that those neocons really thought it would be because even though it... You know, it, it was and is the biggest global power. What you saw actually was not what they thought it would be, which was the, um, the project for the new American century that they, you know, proudly announced in the 1990s, but actually a situation where um, we've seen the U.S. have become weakened, both economically, even though it's still by far the big, biggest military power, it's also, um, it, it can't use its military power as freely as it might like. And I want to just talk about that because it has profound implications for the world that we see it today and why it looks very different to the bipolar world of the Cold War. And that's the contradiction we have to understand. What is, you know, how come the, the world's greatest power has been weakened and what does it mean for us and what does it mean for the dangers of future wars? And I think it's important then when, I, when we look at this, when we look at today, is just to understand our analysis of what imperialism means. Because I think there is some on the left who see imperialism as just anything that big, bad USA does. You know, and it's also just about all getting stuff, ripping off the oil from the Middle East, ripping, you know. And of course, this has been an element of imperialist power and imperialist um, expansion. But we have to see that imperialist, imperialism is not just about the USA, nor is it even just about the biggest imperialist power ripping off smaller ones. It's actually a product of a global system. It's actually a systemic um, system which it, 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 it represents conflicts between many states. Some of them people would regard as sub-imperial states, but smaller global powers actually battling it out. Some of them have the backing of bigger, bigger powers. Some of them don't. Some of them are shifting allegiances. You know, that sense of actually understanding it as a system rather than one big power ripping off everybody else is something that we, ha you know, if you go away with one thing from the meeting, we want to, under, we want to understand that. And that geopolitical, geopolitical competition that is rooted in capitalism and that therefore is the, is the bed from which imperialism grows, if you like, something that Lenin Bukharin talked about and described around the time of the First World War, but the thinking is something that still helps us understand today. And that's why today... You know, when we face what I'd argue now is a multipolar um, world, if you like, both in terms of nuclear weapons, but just let's talk about just ordinary military conflicts. And I think that in itself is a symptom, um, an evidence, if you like, of the weakening power of the, of the U.S. And, you know, clearly, 
I've said that it's still the biggest, and it still is. I mean, but look how it shrunk. In 1945, the U.S. accounted for over 50% of global GDP. But at the turn of the century, this had been cut back to around 25%. And, you know, when I said it's the biggest military power, it is by far. Um, the, um, the U.S. accounted for 35% of global military expenditure last year. And that's more than the next seven countries combined. So let's not, you know, when they go on about Russia or go on about other countries, you know, let's get the proportions in our heads about what, what, what the U.S. still represents. But the, the, the limits to what they can do even with this is something that I think is both interesting but also illustrates something that means the world is more complex than it was during the time of the Cold War. And let's remember why. And some of it's been discussed in meetings, previous meetings at Marxism. I mean, when 9-11 happened, it gave Bush, it gave the American ruling class the excuse. I mean, first they went to Afghanistan. That was a side thing, which let's look at the state, look what happened to Afghanistan. Um, but actually it gave the excuse to go into Iraq and bring down Saddam Hussein, somebody who was an ally, and they, but then they decided he wasn't uh, playing there by their rule book and wanted to bring him down. And this was not just about ripping off the oil in the region. It was about trying to control the tap. It's a strategic thing about thinking about who else was going to be buying and needing oil from that region, and they wanted to be in control of that, not least China, So, I, and which, I, which I'm going to come back to. And I think that sense that they also wanted to break the Vietna Vietnam syndrome, where they had been beaten and crushed by the Vietnamese people, but I said it in a previous meeting, they created something new, the Iraq syndrome. Because Iraq was a disaster for the American ruling class. An absolute disaster. What they wanted for the new American century meant they were absolutely um, still dealing with its um, aftermath, aftermath today. And if you think that uh, what Obama wanted to do was to sort of lock down the Middle East and pivot to Southeast Asia, didn't he? He wanted to look at what China was doing, the Southeast China Sea. He wanted to actually combat that but constantly getting sucked back into the Middle East, constantly so getting sucked back into, the, into that wider region. And I think that most spectacularly um, by the revolutions of 2011, where two of the West's closest allies were brought down by mass popular revolutions um, in, in, those, in those revolutions. And of course, the counter-revolution is victorious right now. And that was what was very powerful about the, the last meeting on Syria. But remember... The dictators were brought down. And remember how the West was on the back foot. You know, they hung on to supporting the Tunisia dictator until he was on a plane leaving for Paris. You know, they were, you know Cl Hillary Clinton went on about how wonderful, um, you know, it, it, the, they didn't really want at all to back the Egyptian revolution. But suddenly they had to. And then they were running around, you know, with Egyptian children saying, isn't this wonderful for um, progress? But actually they were on the back foot. So, you know. This happened. This is not something that was a dream, and now it's all gone. Of course, the counter-revolution has crushed that, and we see the revenge of a ruling class, you know, if, if a revolution doesn't go all the way. But I think that sense, it also created the instability, and, and it showed the America's inability, if you like, to completely control events. Because they have, up until then, thought that the Arab people were just pawns in their chess game, multi-level or not. They didn't think for a moment that those people would actually not only revolt, but revolt in such a fundamental way as to bring down their own allies. And so this is the contradiction that we, that we face, the most powerful nation in the globe, but also without the ability to completely intervene and control things across the globe. And this is really taps into how you see the Trump people and the, the ruling class in America being worried, saying, but there's anarchy out there. How can we control it? We've got to stop this. People, you know, this idea that people are taking advantage of us, this idea that how come we can't just go in and smash these people and tell them what to do and demand Iran, you know, it doesn't, doesn't sell oil to everybody. And I think whether it's in Eastern Europe, Syria, or the Southeast China Sea, you've got a sense of the, the frustration and the, the sort of disbelief, if you like, amongst some of the American ruling class that they can't just go in there and do what they want. And I think when you look at China in particular, and this has been, China has been in the sights, if you like, of the US ruling class for some time, but actually, you know, they have been unable to challenge. And I mean, when I said, you know, China was 
building its reach in the Southeast China Sea. I mean, it's literally doing it. You know, it's building, um, you know, extensions to islands and rocks where they can put aircraft carriers. At one time, the Chinese state said, we're doing that so if any ship sunk in the region, it would be easier for us to rescue people. Um, but, of course, that's not, that's not what it's about. And actually building a navy to challenge the U.S. Navy, which has been really the dominant force in, the, in, in, uh, in, that, in that region. And there is a sort of a regional arms race developing which is also destabilizing it. And I don't have time for all the figures. I've got them here, but, you know, time becomes short. That China has seen its political and economic and military power all increase over recent years. And, I mean, according, um, let me see, China's 2017 GDP was at 14.9% of the global share. America was 25%. And the IMF says this will just surpass America, perhaps in 10, 15, whatever years. Who knows about the projections? But the fact is the growth is there. And actually, um, U.S. arms spending was 30 times greater than China's in 89, but now it's less than three times as great um, in 2016. So you can see the shifting balance there. And of course, a global player, China is a global player economically. You know, huge investments in Latin America. And actually, Latin America the U.S.'s backyard, they've almost abstained from Latin America because of the whole of their resources and thinking, if you like, has been, you know, absorbed by what's going on, um, by what's going on in the Middle East. But also, uh, China, China's investment in the continent of Africa is enormous and growing. And again, this is something. I mean, if you look at, um, in 2016... Um, Chinese investment in Africa was 36 billion, um, but this was compared to th just over 3 billion by the US, um, Britain 2.4. So it completely dwarfed, if you like, um, the Western countries' investment in, in Africa. But, uh, you know, this, this sense of the changes and what does it mean in terms of the weakening? And I think the other thing to understand is that both this the economic decline of America, and even with its military might not being able to use it, a sense of actually even the, both the strategy that the American ruling class has got, and Trump's strategy is just, you know, be the dominant individual and just bluster through like it's a business deal, but also that sense of actually the tactics of war have changed. They are not talking about boots on the ground. They are talking about... I mean, Obama did the most drone strikes of any other. You know, they changed the tactics because actually that was something they felt they, they, they needed to do. And that's the sense of how it means that actually a weaker U.S. doesn't necessarily make the, war, the world a safer place. It actually can actually make it more dangerous in many ways. And I just finally, just a little bit about the politics that are driving some of this. Because I think what Trump's victory part of it was he tapped into the sense of America is no longer as great as it was. Now, for working class people, he put it as, you know, you don't dig coal anymore. You don't make cars. You don't do the things that Americans used to do. Tapped into that sense of inferiority that perhaps people felt. And working class people had been trashed by the neoliberals. There's no question about it. They didn't give a damn about what neoliberalism had done to the American working class. And Trump, even though he's a billionaire, was able to tap into that. But also amongst the ruling class, we've got to make America great again. And I think that's something, you know, Trump is not a mad buffoon. I think we'd be very wrong to write him off as that, nor is Putin for that matter. You know, the ideology, the sort of the right-wing populism, I mean, some of the academics call it thin ideology, you know, the anti-elites. Everything can be blamed on the elites. I mean, this ideology can be sort of fattened. It can be broadened out and filled out, you know, but that anti-elites, it means that Trump, whatever he does, he says, I'm doing this to attack the elites. And if he fails, he blames the elites. So actually, he feels he can't lose. And I think that's what some of those people, the New York Times people and the Democrats and the liberals in America don't understand. They keep saying, the link with Russia will finish him because we can call him a traitor. Or this will finish him. Or this court case or this investigation. Now, one of them might. But also, he might be able to wear them as a badge of honor. Look how much they're scared of me. So I just think we have to understand how that populism can work. When you have won people who are so cynical about the ruling class, so questioning about how much the ruling class cares about them, they do that. Now, but, but let's be clear, this populism does not mean that he is transforming the U.S. economy in the interest of ordinary working class people in Ohio or wherever. Of course not. 
He is actually fighting for the interests of the US ruling class and the rich, and all his policies so far have been to benefit them, whether it's tax cuts and everything else. So, you know, the arguments are very different than, than, what, we, than what is actually happening. And, of course, this is where I mentioned that the features that, that actually Putin and him have in common, and also they have in common with some of the other far-right and racist parties in, in Europe. And I think that the chauvinism, the nationalism, the strong state, the anti-immigrants, anti-minorities, the social conservatism of anti-LGBT people against women's rights, these are all common features that we can see. And it'd be foolish not to try and understand that this is something that is growing and something that we have to address. And I think that when we look in conclusion at the idea, is it more dangerous and more likely um, for war? We have to say, history's never going to be reenacted, you know, but actually we can learn from it and what it means. And I think the flashpoints of nationalism and migration and anti-immigration and the borders, the obsession with borders, you know, Hungary builds a fence, um, you know, Italy says they're going to push away, the, um, push away the boat, or did, you know, of migrants. These are important flashpoints. I mean, actually, the, one of the, the deputy leader of the Northern League in Italy said, it's clear there are profound similarities in our and Trump's political programs, from the fight against illegal immigration to tax and above all relations with the EU. So they see the commonality. And so, therefore, I think that sense of, you know, that... Russia's not about to face off a U.S. in a global war, but it can actually push its weight around in, it, in certain regional conflicts that mean that Russia is pushed back, such as Syria. And so the sense of volatility, instability, the potential for accident, for escalation is all there. And that's what, you know, that's the dangerous part of it. And also, even though I said I don't believe nuclear war is around the corner, and let's hope not, but the sense of even the small wars can be destructive and bloody and brutal. Look at Syria. Look what the Saudis are doing um, in Yemen. And ob obviously the Saudis are a big player, both in Syria and others, and will become increasingly so if the battle with Iran goes on. So the sense of even so-called smaller conflicts are things that we have to oppose. And time and again... In Britain and in America, we're being told that we have to go and intervene in this to help people. To do it's never about humanitarianism. It's never about helping, and that's why we, you know, in, in the SWP and others, have always been active in the Stop the War Coalition, ready to respond to the next threat of war when it comes. But I tell you what, we don't have to wait for the threat of the right-wing racist nationalism and populism that Trump is encouraging and giving confidence to. Because not only is he himself coming here on Friday, but the people who gain, gain confidence from his politics and his power will be marching on the sun, Saturday. And so therefore, we've got an opportunity to actually play our role in actually pushing back these politics and trying to help fight for a safer world for all of us. Hi, I'm Mirfat from Birmingham. Uh, I'm from Yemen. Uh, I'm just going back to the attack of the uh, Houthi and, and Saleh Alliance uh, going to the south of Yemen. I'm from, uh, from Aden, from the south of Yemen. Um, so uh, then the Saudis' intervention uh, and the Gulf country come up. And uh, we know from our historical uh, um, alliance with Russia that the Saudis really forever hated South Yemen because of, of, of the, the communist um, influence in, in South Yemen. So the, nevertheless, people thought, oh, okay, well, these our brothers, the Sunni, come in to, to help us against the, the, the Shia, which is a sectarian um, uh, use of, of, of them. So some people welcome the, uh, the Saudis consciously um, and, and uh, the Gulf intervention. Now, three years back, we see there is um, Aden, there is nothing really the Gulf offered uh, to the local people. There's no services, everything smashed in the war, stay smashed in the war. The only uh, little contribution is like a uh, paint in schools that they took pictures and a few food contribution here and there to try to, um, you know, convince people that they came for humanitarian. So I totally agree with, they always use that as, you know, we come in to, to, to help the reason and we um, uh, intervene into, into that. But unfortunately, since then, the, the, what's uh, called the, the freed bit of, of, of the South is um, totally, un, um, um, the, um, the services, the, the uh, pensions and uh, salaries, uh, services, all smashed and stayed for two, three years now. No war, no, you know, areas clear from war, still nothing really the Gulf country offered uh, the, the southerners. And still the, the war to continue using young peoples to go and fight in the North 
and trying to push the Houthi and install um, the, uh, the, the, the government that they like. So well, I'm saying, I'm, I'm not quite sure really where we go, go on, uh, in, in Yemen, but it doesn't look any, any helpful. And it's just part of the small region. Although Russia not in, intervening in an open um, uh, manner, in there maybe like how, how they're doing in, in Syria, but they are behind the, the uh, Iranian uh, intervention with the Houthis, so it's, it's a bloody mess, really. Hi, I'm uh, Malcolm from North London. Um, this is kind of history repeating itself, not necessarily just from the Cold War of over 30 years ago or something like that, but um, what happened in Europe in uh, the period between 1929 and 1945, and we know how that ended. Um, this, this September marks the 10th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which was the, um, the 1929 moment for Western capitalism, American capitalism again. Um, so we had 1929, we got Hitler. We had uh, no, uh, 2008, we got Trump. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, capitalism hasn't learned its you know, lessons from its failed history, um, you know, you might as well call it same shit, different day, or different century. Um, and this is, this is a serious, serious problem that we, 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 need, to, we need to kind of deal with. The, the, you know, the, the, the crisis has, has thrown up um, uh, people of the sort of left and center left, you know, like Obama uh, 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 and so forth. And it also turned up people from the far right, in, certainly in, in Eastern Europe and, and, and things like that. We, we, we really, really do need to learn those historical lessons. Are the comrade all the way at the back at the left of the room, who indicated? I want to stress how important it is a working understanding of imperialism and how it applies to us today in terms of talking about a contradictory world that we're working in. I, for my sins, are invited to the Trump coalition, Trump Together, which is going to organize a fantastic demonstration that's going to take place on the 13th, which we have to organize. But what is the sharpest argument that's taking place there? The sharpest argument that's taking place there is over Hillary Clinton, about why Hillary Clinton is better than Trump and the argument is over the question of wars and intervention over Syria and various other countries. In other words, the question about how you reorganize the world and what Obama did is the argument about how you organize opposition against, against Trump. The argument is that we can't have people who oppose the war in Iraq leading uh, the, the intervention is because they don't understand that you have to have wars sometimes in terms of intervening in Syria. Unless you have a clear understanding of imperialism, and the role that it plays inside society, it actually affects your practice, practice today. And actually, what this contradiction that's taking place now, you can, you can see it. One of the discussions that took place there, people talked about the rise of China having a strike group. That, do you mean, is it good that China has a strike group? For the first time, China's organized an aircraft carrier group to take challenge in terms of the South, South, uh, South Asia seas. And people saying that, really, you have to root the question of the democratic countries, the US, um, Germany and the UK has to have superiority over other countries in order to maintain security across the world. In other words, this whole idea of superiority of the West over everything else, and it dovetails with the whole question of the attitude towards, uh, towards, uh, um, towards, towards Islamophobia. But what, what I think is the decline of the United States and the rise of newly industrializing countries militarizing themselves is made a much more unstable world, but a weaker center also gives the potential for when people resist that they can't use the same kind of force in order to dominate and push you back. It's good that Trump says, why can't I invade Venezuela? That's why he, what he said. But it's interesting what the generals said to him. They said to him, beware of the law of unintended consequences. 
One, you'll, st you'll start a mass movement that could take place inside South America. How would you deal with that? We've already got problems with those people. In other words, there's a fear of a movement that could take place there and destabilize America in its backyard. This instability, the fact there isn't, as Jack Straw put it, one superpower, is also the potential of the alternative force to resist. That's why you're seeing the left wing get elected inside Mexico. Part of the rise of Trump is... Part of the rise of Trump will be resistance against both imperialism and what he stands for, and that's what will take place in the demonstration on the 13th and the 14th, opposing both populism, racism, Islamophobia. Stop there. Okay, um, I think what we're seeing is kind of a history repeating itself in terms of the way that American politics works. I think Trump's doing it a few years earlier than I thought he would do it. But as you see that with George Bush and a lot of people, American presidents go to war to keep themselves in office because it scares the American population into thinking we don't want to change right now if we're in a war. And it works in America. I think Trump is just doing it a, on a faster schedule than I thought that he might do it. But I think we will see the ramping up of this in the American media over the next few years to kind of make the American people feel like they're really, because they are in wars, you know, but it's not being talked about as much, you know, because it's drone strikes and everything. But I think there will be a ramping up of this rhetoric about being at war more and more and more not only to make Trump feel like he's a strong man because he, he loves that, you know, he loves the attention and everything, but also as a way to kind of protect himself to make sure that he gets the second term that he wants. And that is a, kind of just a history repeating itself within America. I think Trump will use that and he's using the nuclear threat as a new kind of be scared, you know, because if you don't keep me in, something even worse could happen. If you have somebody who's going to come in and maybe won't want to use the nuclear button, we'll be weak. And it's just a cycle that repeats itself in America over and over. Uh, I think the other thing that's interesting about the, uh, the situation is the knots that the uh, imperialists get themselves into. I'll give you two examples. Uh, one was that at one point over the last two or three years, the Americans have found themselves fighting alongside Iranian forces in Iraq to drive out ISIS. And now they're talking about going to war with Iran. It's an extraordinary situation. And they're, they're still in alliance with, the, with the Iranian forces in Iraq. They're still there. And so are the Iranian forces. The, the, other, the, other, the other incredible contradiction is with Turkey. Turkey is part of NATO. Um, and now there's a row between the US and Turkey over what happens to the Kurds. Because the Americans have been backing the Kurds in, dri in, driving, out, um, in driving out Turkish forces from, uh, from, northern, from the northern part of Syria. And the, Amer and the, 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 the Turkish uh, Erdogan and the, uh, and the Turkish state wants to drive out the Kurds from that part of Syria. So they're, you know, the, the Americans have been backing the Kurds, and the, now they're... Anyway, the, the whole thing becomes a complete lunacy, to be honest. And it's incredible as to how they're going to actually get out of the knots that they tie themselves into as a result of all this. And you could, in fact, find situations where there could be skirmishes between Turkish and, and, and American forces and so on and so forth. And anyway, so that's it. That's another huge uh, issue that they're going to have to overcome in their, in their war game. Sorry, I wanted to talk about Kurds as well. I put my hand up before you got to Kurds. Sorry. Um, one of the things Judith mentioned earlier on in the talk was Hillary Benn's comment about likening um, um, intervening in Syria to the Spanish Civil War. Um, but the, you know, there are kids from this country who think that it is, who are going out to help the, the YPG and the YPJ in Syria, the, the Kurdish forces. Um, and these are um, organizations that sort of style themselves on Abdullah Ocalan's ideology, which is a kind of mesh of, of socialism and, and Kurdish nationalism. I expect this, that's a terrible oversimplification that people might want to correct. But yeah, these organizations do style themselves as lead in um, a, you know, a Kurdish socialist movement. Um, and there are people going out with the idea that they're, they're supporting this. Um, and I think what um, Wayman was saying about the necessity from a, for an understanding of imperialism to ground you in these circumstances is very important because we do have to you know, have the strength, if you like, to argue with people who are traditionally very much our allies and people that we've got sympathies with within the, the Kurdish movements in this country, um, you know, with Kurdish friends, who 
understandably enough, have a view of, well, why shouldn't we take the, take the Americans' guns? We're you know, in a situation in Syria desperately trying to fight to carve out a space. Um, and obviously, in, in situations like this, where there are proxy wars being fought all over the globe, none of these guns come without strings attached. And clearly, we're going to see a repeat of um, the Kurds being absolutely abandoned to their fate. Or alternatively, perhaps a less likely outcome, the risk of the creation of a kind of Kurdish Israel in this region. You know, the things are so unstable and, you know, the, that you, could, you couldn't rule that out in the future that um, America would see the possibility of using the Kurds to um, sort of destabilize the area in America's own interests and have a, a kind of another satellite state. That, if you like, is an option that you know, some of the, the Kurdish groups would think would be something that they would go for because it would give them um, a sense of you know, a, a freedom and a state in that area that they could build from. But it's something where we've got to be prepared to... To, to lay that out um, to our friends who, you know, are, have got illusions in what America is um, is using them for, really, I think. Um, I'd just like to come back on the discussion around the motivation on the part of Trump for saber-rattling and militarism and so forth and indeed, by extension, uh, other, not only U.S., but uh, great power leaders. Because it is, of course, true that um, our ruling classes always try to take popular advantage of militarism and the drive to war and seek to, st to consolidate that into uh, a popular nationalist support base um, at home. But I think it would be a mistake to see this as the prime motivation. I mean, take one example in the close to home of the Falklands War um, for Thatcher. Now, um, at one, you know, there was a common argument, uh, which wasn't totally uh, without uh, truth, that Thatcher was waging this in a, in a situation where she was deeply unpopular and she used the Falklands War to turn her popularity around. Now, this, this is true, but there's a couple of things to say about this. One, it wasn't only just about this. For the British military and the ruling class, the prospect of Argentina taking over this island, which had no resource implications for Britain, did, was important. Why? Because it spoke to the issue of Britain's military global reach and its relationship and influence within imperialism and particularly with the United States. And that was, at the end of it, the key driver. There's a, there's a second point to make about this. that the, It's true that in the aftermath, the support for the war, the Falklands War, I haven't got the exact figures, it was something like 70 to 80 percent. It was incredibly high. This was not true of the Iraq War. Not only were there two million on the streets, from really from the start, the majority of the population were opposed to the war. And president and ruler after ruler have paid a terrible price for their interventions. In Vietnam, it destroyed two American presidents, LBJ and Nixon. Afghanistan destroyed the Russian, you know, the, 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 you know had a huge impact on Russian imperialism and so forth. And for Blair, the Iraq war, well, we need to say ultimately... It was the key factor in his own demise. So I think we have to look at the roots of, what, of the drive to war beneath the kind of nationalist, whipping up of nationalist fervor that, of course, these leaders do. So um, to some people, it's hardly imaginable how much the political landscape in Europe, in Britain, and also in my country has changed over the past 10 years. And uh, there's, also, there's always a tendency for many people on the left to draw the conclusion we can't do anything ourselves and this is just such a phase. Actually, 10 years ago was just such a phase and we've had them before. And it's totally untrue. When you look at the history of imperialism, for instance, in the, in the Middle East, I, uh, I can remember uh, at, at some time there were dictators who seemed a very stable uh, uh, force in the region. You talk about Mubarak, you talk about 
Gaddafi, you talk about uh, the, the, the even in Saudi Arabia uh, now, now things are moving, I even if you don't get much of the news. And this is so, so the situation now uh, you have to understand has developed from that from then from there. And I remember very clearly that uh, there was a point where the anti-war movement, uh, just a bit more than 10 years ago, has been on the verge of toppling Tony Blair over the project in the Middle East. This was a fantastic experience. We didn't make it. As a result, we got into a backlash. As a result, we got uh, the anti-immigrant hysteria. As a result, we got the far right. And as a result, we got more war in the Middle East. But we booked some progress because no dictator in the region looks stable, not even in Morocco, where they take to the streets when a, when, when a fish salesman uh, is, is actually sort of killed, killed by the police. This is a long-term hollowing out of the of stability of the capitalist system. And of course, they will fight for their power and their wealth by any means they can. We have to realize ourselves, they won't be honest. The first victim is the truth. They won't put in their papers in how many shambles they are. We'll write it in the socialist worker. We write it in our own press. But they'll be lying all along. And everybody that believes a word of what our politicians and our experts and so on say, you're misguided. So when, when we have the impression the only thing we can do now is support Jeremy Corbyn, it's untrue. It's untrue. There is a fight we can have. We can support the movements. I can remember the solidarity uh, on, on, on various anti-war conferences, and it was fantastic. Muslims, socialists, trade unionists talking about how we stop the war, how we can create a different world, and what have you. They want to bury the tradition, and exactly the people that fight for peace and that fight for workers' rights will be, will be labeled fascists. fascists. It happens to Muslims, it happens to socialists. They give us exactly the same treatment. This proves to, that, to them we are a real threat. I think we have to build up that threat even more. We have to read and write for the socialist work. We have to build a socialist movement. We're the only ones actually telling the truth about what you can do, and we can really do a lot. We have only our change to lose. So, so Judith, we'll swap. Um, thanks very much. I think that, um, you know, just what uh, the last speaker and others referred to, the byproducts, if you like, of the last wars, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Islamophobia that we've seen across Europe and in Britain, um, and actually, you know, the Stop the War Coalition, one of the first, when you know, it was created, um, one of the first slogans of it was fighting against Islamophobia, and knowing that this sense of trying, the ruling class trying to create an enemy, an other, if you like, um, and that's what they certainly do. And certainly the whole sense of Muslims today in Britain still, you know, a, a something will immediately be deemed a terrorist act by the media if they find out what skin color or religion the person who perpetrated something might be. But if it isn't something that's been done by Muslims, suddenly they talk about mental health or what might be the reasons behind something that might have happened, etc. And so that is, is absolutely, it is fundamental to what we do every day is that... Um, that we're, that we're challenging that and understanding how that has fitted with the ruling class to try to justify and, um, um, you know, and, and to create an enemy. Well, an enemy at home, they've been called, haven't they? As well as uh, treat it the same way as an enemy beyond. And I think that's why, you know, this thing about sort of ideology and, you know, the, the motives. You see, I think what's interesting is seeing how the, the, the various uh, U.S. presidents and ruling classes have justified everything they've done all of which is in the U.S. interest. As I, as I pointed out clearly, whatever Trump may claim, you know, he is still representing the interest of the ruling class. Now, of course, there's differences amongst the ruling class about whether that's the correct way, and that's the same across the world. You know, we're talking about a band of ruling brothers not only between national states, but between members of a national ruling class as well. But that sense of, you know, Bush the wanting to be the all-powerful, we're going to go there, we're going to bring down Saddam Hussein, we're going to impose our will, we're going to make the world a place for neoliberalism to expand this great liberal democracy that is America and everything else. And Obama, who many people did have illusions in that he was got, I mean, he got the Nobel Peace Prize, for God's sake. But, you know, it was very much like, oh, I'm going to work with everybody. No, I'm simplifying for the sake of a three minutes summing up. But that sense of trying to put a liberal gloss, wasn't it, on American imperialism. 
on the interests of the U.S. ruling class. He was pursuing them, but in what he and the American ruling class had decided was a more effective and efficient way than what Bush had done, because he really messed up, you know, in Iraq and what it did to the Americans. And I think that uh, what we're facing now is something that's often referred to as chaotic and unpredictable, which obviously in many ways it is. But the ideology that's defending it doesn't really talk about democracy and this sort of, does it? But it, it is all still about pursuing uh, the U.S. ruling class interests around the globe. And, but that sense of how it's justified and how it's sort of um, held up, if you like, by ideas to win people to it. And I think that the whole sense of um, when people see what the U.S. will do, and I think it's right, you know, when we talked about Syria and sort of saying that sometimes the Americans find themselves on the same t side as Iran or the same side as Russia, you know, this is what, you know, when I said the alliances are never principled, you know, they're always about the, the specifics. And I think it's quite right to raise the Kurds because actually, you know, the Kurds are not just the Kurds, are they? There's a number of organizations and political um, currents within Kurdish movements in different borders because, of course, the Kurdish population crosses borders. And, of course, we start with we are for, you know, self-determination for the Kurdish people. But, of course, in reality, sometimes for some of the Kurdish organizations, that has meant going into alliance with America and America helping them, you know, getting out one of the satellite phones and phoning in airstrikes um, to, um, to fight. And I think this is something that uh, we do have to be critical of and we do have to point to the dangers of it for all the reasons that I've talked about and people in the room have talked about at other meetings that actually the U.S. is never going to be there trying to fight for the liberation of the Kurdish people. It's a cynical alliance for whatever might be needed at that time, and they will be and have been dumped when it doesn't suit. I'm being told, go phone the Russians, get them to defend, you know. And so that sense of actually, this is not something that's going to in any way further the cause of any sort of genuine self-determination liberation for the Kurdish people. It can only help strengthen both either regional powers or even the biggest, the biggest power. And I think that when we look at that, just as an aside, and I think it was maybe when the microphone got mixed up, I skipped, that actually one another important thing that Trump has done is actually at a time when really Israel had been very isolated in the global, you know, global politics and that sense of, you know, the injustice faced by the Palestinians, by him moving the embassy, by him sending Ivanka Trump over there, et cetera, et cetera, he's really saying to the you know, to the Israeli state, you know, you do what you like. You know, we're going to maybe use you in alliances that you can make, but actually you've got free, free run. And that's a very dangerous thing because at meetings after meetings in the SWP, we've said that Israel can be the wild card. You know, so when I've talked about the possibility of accident, of something escalating, et cetera, et cetera. You've always got, you know, the, the sense of how Israel can feel that it might just up the stakes and do something. And actually, at the moment, at the moment, Trump is signaling that, you know, that's okay. And I think that is a very, um, a very dangerous um, development. And I think then just, to, just to, to wrap up some of it, because I think that if we come back to the fundamentals... Of what, what are we going to do here about the sort of dangers and the possibilities that we've we exposed? And I think we have to start always, and I know it's something that many of you are familiar with it, but it's always worth reiterating that we never side with our ruling class when it says it's going to go and invade, airstrike, drone, or bomb another country. Whatever the political justifications they might use, and these can change over time, you know, it's for liberation, it's for women's liberation, it's for national liberation, it's against the jihadis, it's against the, t the Taliban. You know, whatever it is, we oppose them. Because Western imperialism, and British imperialism in particular, and we know from history, because we can learn that from history, is that actually is never a force for good. Is never a, co a force for bringing progressive politics or anything else. We don't trust our ruling class in this country. Why on earth would we ever think that they are fit to go and dominate another? So that's rule one. So, you know, out of this complex, difficult world, we, we hold that single uh, principle. But I think it does lead to the other one, and it fits with a little bit what we were just saying about Islamophobia, is that actually one thing that we can do very directly and have done very um, clearly with standard to racism um, is actually say that the people who are the victims of war and conflict are the people that we stand with. We fight for their rights, we work in solidarity with them, and we say, open the borders. Because the ruling classes may be more obsessed with borders than ever, but we don't believe, in the end, there should be any borders. We believe that actually, the, you know, the capitalists like free movement of capital, we want free movement of people. And actually, we do not differ, even though we talk about the victims of war and the refugees who are fleeing Syria and others in the region, 
other places in the region, we don't differentiate between economic migrants and people who are fleeing war. Just as, you know, this isn't a meeting about that, but I just think it's very clear that we don't just say we stand in solidarity with Syrian refugees. We stand in solidarity with everybody who maybe clambers into a boat to escape poverty, you know, somewhere or whatever, because actually all of them are products of a disgusting, irrational, violent system, whether it's at war or not, and we have to stand with them. And I think that is more clear than ever today. Because it's disgusting that our ruling classes are trying to get us to blame some of the most vulnerable, some of the people who have faced the most violent conflict for the problems that we face here. Our NHS can't cope with all these foreigners. The, the housing of council housing can't cope with all these foreigners. Let not that take hold here. Because this is the how they want to turn us against other people, the other, whether it's people you know, in another country or people who are fleeing here from the wars that they helped create. And I think if we, you know, even, you know, you can feel like, well, there isn't a war at the moment that we can be shouting at our ruling class. Well, of course, they're involved in a number of conflicts. But I do think that's the key thing to hold is that actually we, you can't just be, I don't believe it's good enough just to be an anti-war activist. I think you have to be a revolutionary socialist. I think you have to have a vision of a world, not just, I wouldn't be satisfied with a world that has a few less wars you know, a few less conflicts. Perhaps we're not, all the nuclear weapons will get put away. Good? That's not good enough, is it? Because to be honest, again and again, capitalism will generate, because of the economic competition at its heart, will generate more conflicts, will generate more wars. So that's why we have to look at the bigger picture as well in any of these meetings at Marxism, isn't it? About what are we fighting for? And where do these conflicts and the, the terrible carnage that capitalism gives us, not just in overt wars, but in the wars of poverty and where people can't get access to clean water, clean medicine, but actually billions and billions of, I've described are being spent on arms every single year. Billions. You never see, it's the old joke, isn't it? You never see somebody rattling a tin for a nuclear weapon on a high street on a Saturday afternoon. And so that's where I'd like to end, is actually we have an opportunity in the ne this, this week coming to show that we can, we're not just going to sit here and moan about Trump and laugh at him sometimes and realize what a danger he is. We're going to march against him on Friday, but we also have to see the two things together because it would be hypocritical to march on the Friday but not actually see those people that gain confidence from him marching without opposition on the Saturday. So I hope you'll be, you know, everybody who can will do that because this is what we can do in the here and now. But also all of this, all of this is part of us fighting for a vision of a very different world, not only free from war, but free of the system that creates wars in the first place. Thank you.